Have you ever felt like everyone in your life is getting their prayers answered? Having that boyfriend, that big gorgeous wedding, their first baby, buying their first house, and you're being left behind. It's hard not to grow discontent and unhappy, isn't it? Our famous lady of the Bible today is going to show you that you are not alone in this struggle. My name is Tara Hannon from Blooms and Benedictions, where we walk with Christ to find the roses among the thorns of life. There are sticky places, there's difficult things that come our way, we get frustrated, but all you need to remember is that you were born to bloom. You just need living water. Today we're digging into the life of Sarah, who was married to Abraham in the Old Testament. And Sarah's life is a love story that's not just between herself and her husband, but between herself and God. Her life is defined by one amazing characteristic of God that is still blessing us today. So we're gonna find out what that is by digging into her scriptures. So Sarah was originally called Sarai and her story and her journey is going to see her identity be completely altered and changed by her experience. And when we see that in the Bible, when someone gets a name change, it's because the Lord is also working on their heart or going to do a markedly different thing um, in who they are. So Sarai was so beautiful that in like her 70s or 80s, um, there were kings that were desiring her because she was just so attractive. Can you guys even imagine being so beautiful as an old lady that all these kings are after you? Like what kind of skincare regime is this? Like honey and locusts and pomegranates? Like good grief. <laughs> Tell us your secrets, Sarai. But she lacks the one thing that would make her feel totally worthy and valuable, and that is a child. The word says that she was barren. And that's the, the sort of like stain on her life that keeps her from feeling totally fulfilled. Because if you remember at this time in culture, if you were a woman and you didn't have a child, then you were kind of like worthless because your husband didn't have an heir and your family line couldn't go forward. So Sarai um, actually means princess. So she kind of has this um, personality or identity in the beginning of her narrative that connotates that she was wealthy. Um, perhaps a bit spoiled, she's set in her ways, she's comfortable, she's cared for, um, but she's also barren and fearful and upset and angry and sad. And we're gonna see that there are some situations where she grows bitter and jealous and doubting. And that, that causes her to act in an unfair way and even at times vindictive. And so at some point, the Lord is going to change her name and change how she is defined because ultimately be, she becomes known as a woman of faith. So in the next few chapters, a lot of stuff is gonna go down. The Lord is going to ask Abram and Sarai to do some very brave things and to trust him. And he's going to ask them to leave their homeland, leave everything they know, everything that's familiar, their family, their friends, and to travel to a land that they do not know. He's also going to declare to him that he is going to bless him for generations and he's going to give him um, the fatherhood of the nations, which implies obviously that he's going to give him a child. And so it's just astounding in the next couple of verses, how many times God is going to promise to Abraham that he is going to be the father of nations. He's gonna say words like nations, families, offspring, plentiful as the dust of the earth, um, reward, sun, air, stars, as plentiful as the stars in the sky will be his offspring, sojourners, servants, generations, over and over and over. He's going to give him this terminology that is meant to build his faith, right? Like literally God the Father is showing up to him in dreams and visions and spoken word and appearances and confirming his covenant to them, this covenant promise that he is going to give them a child. And it's like building his faith, building his faith over and over in these crazy, like if God showed up in your room and spoke to you, would you not believe? Would you not cling to that word? But yet 
Abram and his wife are still going to take matters into their own hands and, and try to get in God's way. And it's just like, us, we so often feel like you know what's right to do, but you aren't willing to wait for the promise. You aren't willing to suffer through the patience of the journey. We sometimes try to short circuit the process and get ahead of God, but ultimately he is more patient than we are and he has the right order and timeliness. I used to have a pastor and he would always say that God is an on time God. And all that meant was, even if we feel like things aren't going the way we want, God has it in hand. He has ordained for things to happen at a certain time. And we just can't get ahead of him. We can't force his hand. We can't make something happen outside of his will. He is always on time. So I'm going to read you these seven different promises and they're found in chapters 12, 13, 14, and 15 of Genesis. So I encourage you to go back and fully read each of those chapters. But the first one is going to come in chapter 12 when the Lord says, go from your country and kindred and all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So that's the first promise, nation and families. The second one, he's, the Lord appears to Abram and says to your offspring, I will give this land. And he builds an altar there because God had appeared to him. So second promise, offspring. Then in chapter 13, verse 14, the Lord says to Abraham, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth so that if one can count the dust, which we can't, that's crazy then your offspring can also be counted. So again, third promise, right? Dust, like the dust, offspring. Uh, the fourth promise is in chapter 15. And he's going to say, I'm going to give you a reward. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. And then he's also going to say the fifth promise that you will have a son. He says, look toward heaven, number the stars if you're able to number them. So shall your offspring be. Man, over and over again. Then another promise, a deep sleep falls over Abraham. And he says, the Lord says, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. The Lord is predicting and pro proclaiming that the descendants of Abraham will go into slavery under the king of Egypt. Um, so again, he's talking about generations. He's talking about sojourners, offsprings, servants, and it all culminates finally in this idea of a covenant. A covenant was a promise that was made between two people that could not be broken for any reason. And it was created by the shedding of blood. That's why in marriage, it's called cutting covenant because a man and a woman are joined together and they cut covenant and they become one. And so this is the covenant that God creates with Abraham. And that's a big, big deal. There is like bloodshed and, you know, an animal dies and the Lord is just like, this is a promise that I will not go back on. And you think after all of this stuff, there is no possible way that this couple could doubt that they are going to have a child. Like there's been a total of 28 different references to words that refer to children and to offspring. And yet <laughs> they find a way to doubt and it's just so human. It's just exactly like how we are, right? Like we're given so much confirmation, so much encouragement, so much support from the Lord. And he's just like knocking on our hearts and affirming us and saying, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. And we doubt and we doubt and we wonder and we worry. And we're just, we're normal. We're just like Sarah. So what's crazy here is that with one word from his wife, Abram is going to discount all of the things that the Lord God has said to him in seven different dramatic ways with visions, dreams, showing up in person. Um, and it says in chapter 16, verse one, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. 
uh-oh, introducing other women to your marriage is never, ever a good plan. And she says to Abram, behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai, to the voice of his wife over the voice of God. And you just think, what? How is this even possible? But isn't it so characteristic of us? We just get thrown off. We get distracted by the voices of the world, by the voices of friends, by the voices of family that possibly are saying a different thing than God. I don't want you to, to get me wrong here. Sarah is not this just like totally reprobate, like evil woman who just throws Abraham off his game. She is also faithful. She's been faithful for 80 years. She's been serving the Lord. She's been waiting for this child and she just gets impatient. And don't we do the same thing? Sometimes we just try to get um, something to happen by our own strength and our own energy. And God's like, no, wait, my plan is better. My process is better. I have good things for you. I have that handsome boyfriend. I have that girlfriend for you. I have that amazing marriage. I have that, that man of deep character, the things that are eternal, the things that matter. Don't get ahead of me. Don't look outside of my will. Don't introduce this nonsense. But in one word, Abram listens to his wife and they get off track. So Hagar, the servant, she ends up having a baby with Abram and they name him Ishmael. And right away, Sarai starts getting jealous as you would. She's upset, she's frustrated. She feels like this was not a good choice and she starts to look on contempt. Um, to Hagar and is jealous of her and she wants her out of her life and she starts dealing harshly with her, which is just so cruel because she involves this woman who was innocent to the plan and then she treats her meanly. But the Lord is going to take care of Hagar. So even when people treat you cruelly, remember that the Father is looking out for you. Meanwhile, back on the home front, uh, Abram and Sarai, they still don't have a baby. They still don't have a child. And so the Lord is going to reconfirm in chapter 17 that all of these good things are going to come to pass. This is, this, this is the eighth time where he is going to appear and give a promise. And he is going to say the word in this section the word covenant 13 different times. There's going to be 28 different allusions toward a child. He's gonna say son, nations, kings, peoples, child, born, son, offspring, Isaac. He's even gonna give the baby a name. And you know what? <laughs> They're still gonna doubt. You guessed it. <laughs> After all of this, all of these declarations that he is going to cut covenant and that Abram will be the father of a multitude of nations, um, they're still gonna doubt. And so it says in chapter 18 that the Lord appears again to Abram. And then he says in verse nine, where is Sarah, your wife? And he says, she's in the tent. And the Lord says, well, I will surely return to you about this time next year and Sarah, your wife shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, not like a faithful, ha ha ha, that's so exciting, but like a derisive laugh, like, yeah, I'm super old. That's not gonna happen. I haven't, you know, needed pads or tampons for years now. So she is laughing to herself and she says, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have the pleasure of a child? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Mm, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> He's always listening. And say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? And then he says in verse 14, so powerfully, is anything too hard for the Lord? No, it is not. At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denies it. <laughs> she denies that she laughs and she says, I did not laugh. 
because she was afraid. She knew that she had been out of faith. She knew that after all of these declarations of promise that she had still doubted. And then of course she's fearful, like God Yahweh is literally talking to her husband and she's fearful that perhaps she will get, you know, punished or in trouble for doubting the word of the Lord. So there's a lot of powerful truths that are coming about in this narrative of Sarah's life. And we need to remember that God will test your faith, but he will simultaneously build you up by his word. Does he not do to that to them? When he calls them out from familiar places to unknown things, he constantly is affirming them, constantly building them up. So I encourage you to look for that in your life. When your best friends are getting married and they're having their first babies and it's hard and it's hard to feel sidelined and like you're just watching from the outside. See what the Lord is teaching you. See what he is speaking to your heart and what he is comforting you with. What are the blessings that you have in your life? Perhaps you have the freedom to push forward in your career or to work on your health or to dig deep into you know, your Bible in a way that a new mother can't. There's always a silver lining that the Lord provides for us. And I encourage you also to record his promises. Write them down and don't let even the most trusted human voices deter you from your purpose. Sometimes waiting on God's promises is painful. Do you not think that it was painful for Sarah to watch woman after woman, relative, um, probably nieces, nephews go on to get married and have children? Sometimes it's very painful to wait on the promises of God, but we need to choose to be productive in the waiting. Amen? We can't just get bitter and start being punitive and punishing to those in our lives, um, distancing ourselves from friends that we're upset with because things are going well for them. That's not the character of Christ. He says, be supportive of them, you know, cheer them on, be productive. It talks about um, a little story where Lot actually gets captured by some men and it's in uh, chapter 14 and it's very interesting and I want to point out that when Abram goes after him to rescue him, it says um, in verse 14 that when he heard his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them. And so he leads them and, and they fight with him. And it's interesting to think that Abram has mentored, mentored and trained and fathered, in a sense, these 318 mighty loyal men that were born in his house during a season of waiting. And how painful that must have been for him to see the progeny of so many faithful servants and friends and, and they're birthed into his very estate because he's wealthy and he's powerful. Um, and it was really difficult, I'm sure, for him to see all those babies and to yearn for that and to hope for that and yet to watch his body age and to grow old and for Sarah to lose her period and, and all these things. And yet he's not punishing and he's not... Um, acting jealously, but he supports those 318 men. And I just think it's so beautiful that the Bible points that out, born in his house. That's a thing that we're supposed to notice. So we need to be productive in the waiting. Um, remember that God's timing is always perfect, but his promises require patience. Amen? We can't get ahead of God and try to make it happen. So we know the end of the story, right? <laughs> the miracle comes to pass and little baby Isaac is born. Sarah has her baby guy. And he says to them, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Abram falls on his face and God says to him, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. Again, over and over, nations and covenant and generations and offspring. And then he says, I'm also gonna change Sarah's name, um, Sarai's name to Sarah. And he does that. And so the end of the story is that they have that baby, that promised guy. And Isaac means laughter. 
And I think that's so beautiful because it's also this idea of redeeming our reactions. Sometimes we react in a way that is not godly and the Lord needs to work on our reactions. When we're jealous of that friend's success, when we're jealous of her cute husband or her pastor husband or whatever it is, the thing that you want and you, you earnestly desire for that career and that promotion. Um, but the Lord redeems her reaction where at first she derisively laughs, right? At the promise of God. But then she names her baby laughter because now the whole community can rejoice in this success, in this promise fulfilled. And they can remember that this was the woman who was barren and old in age, and now she has been welcomed into the community of motherhood. And she has this little baby and his name is Isaac. So let's take some life lessons from Sarah's journey. Um, number one, you will not be judged by a moment of weakness. Sarah lived a life of faithfulness. She was faithful when her husband pretends that she's his sister for a minute and gives her to a foreign king. She's faithful to leave hearth and home and to travel to unknown lands. She's faithful, faithful, faithful over and over for 80 years. And she has this moment of weakness where she tries to get ahead of God and fulfill the promise in her own way. But God is faithful regardless. And that's the thing that we have to remember from her story, that God's faithfulness saves the day. That's what covenant is. It's a faithfulness unto himself, not to your frail human failings of faithfulness, but to his own. He is going to come through on his word and there's nothing that you can do about it. Amen? But our impatience, lesson number two, often can bring pain and conflict to other people. So although the Lord is gracious and he, you know, will forgive you, there, there are repercussions and it can cost other people and bring about pain in their life. Number three, temperance, generosity, and kindness far outweigh external beauty. Amen. Number four, don't get ahead of God. His plan is always preferable to your own. Number five, don't be that person that has to learn things the hard way. Listen to the advice and revelation of others. Number six, jealousy is a poison that robs the potential of your relationships. Don't let that sneak in. Be happy for your friend when she's crushing it. Number seven, when man abandons, betrays, or takes advantage of you, God will provide. Number eight, um, this is especially true in marriage. Anytime one partner receives a blessing or honor, it should equal rejoicing for both. There is no place for competition in marriage. Um, and number nine, Testifying to God's goodness is meant to bring joy and edification to our corporate faith. When she has that baby, that blesses everybody, not just her and Abraham. It blesses the entire community. Um, number 10, covenant stands forever. You can't screw it up. There are no time limits or lapses. Amen. That is the most beautiful thing about Sarah's story, that covenant lasts forever. And we now can enter into that promise. We now can enter into covenant and we are part of that eternal story. So I challenge you, if there's a thing that you are still in the waiting, you're still in that season of hoping and yearning, begin to pray for someone else. Pray for someone else that is struggling with that very thing and watch and see that the Lord does not fulfill the promise in both of your lives. He is a good God and he honors his word. Amen. So chapter 21, the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. She conceived, she bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time which God had spoken to him. And they named him Isaac because everyone who hears will laugh over me. <laughs> God has made laughter for me. Isn't that awesome? The Lord took a place of pain and turned it into a place of joy and a place of laughter. I'm so happy that you guys show up with me every week 
and we dive into the women of the Bible. And I hope that you feel that you have learned so much that you can carry into ordinary life in modern tumultuous times. I'm Tara Hannon from Blooms and Benedictions. Come back, stick with me on this journey. We will keep growing in Christ together every day, more and more like his image. Love you guys. See you next time.